So welcome everybody. Uh, this is course number 11 or unit number 11 of the course on mathematical signal processing. And uh, the main subject of today will be the L1 case. Uh, so the traditional topic of free analysis for most mathematicians. Um, I will first give you, uh, and that's really fresh, I have uh, added these uh, notes uh, just now, uh, give you an explanation of the situation so that you have some orientation. Uh, the starting point of our consideration was the harmless space of continuous bounded functions endowed with the supnorm, but because it's kind of too big, we uh, consider mostly the functions vanishing at infinity. So it's called C0, and it's a closed subspace, actually a closed subalgebra, or even an ideal within the bounded continuous functions. And uh, every element in this space can be approximated by continuously uh, continuous functions with compact support. And this is a very good exercise place to understand how to work in a functional analytic setting. You're verifying things for elements from a dense subspace, and then you take limits, and it's always the same epsilon trick, and maybe you split your epsilon into five epsilon over five pieces, and you add up, and so on. Now, if you have some experience with functional analysis, where you are having uh, not only the Banach space, but also the dual space, and you can think of this as a set of all possible coordinates in all possible finite dimensional subspaces. So an infinite dimensional space is just a very big space where there is no possibility of finding a finite base. Therefore, linear mappings have to be described in a different way. And uh, you can describe everything by projecting it onto all those finite dimensional spaces. Now, if you think of all the possible coordinates in all possible finite dimensional spaces, you're exactly ending up with the set of all linear functionals. So that's the, the reason why functional analysis is using always the dual space. Now, we call the elements of the dual space the bounded measures, and we have established with the help of these partitions of unity that also the measures can be approximated by compactly supported measures, because if you split the measure into pieces of the form mu psi i, then the absolute sum of the pieces measured in the dual space is exactly the norm of the measure. So as I say, usually it's the splitting into the, uh, it's just a analog of the sigma additivity, which you learn in the course on measure, measure theory. Now, we have the same situation if you take a function and you take partial sums of a partition of unity, just remind you that E is, let's say, the index set from minus 100 to plus 100. You're creating a plateau function with smooth boundaries. And if you multiply F from C0 with such a function, you get a function which has compact support, but also uh, it uh, is a good approximation because F is small if you are outside of the plateau function. Now, the problem that we will fight a little bit later on is that we have the dual space, the measures, and the ordinary functions, the signals, and they are not contained one in the other. We will improve that situation, uh, but this is the subject maybe of the next course. So we have an identification. We can identify every function g in L1, uh, if you are using Lebesgue integration theory, or at least in the bounded continuous functions with compact support, and you're saying, okay, I integrate my input signal against the density. And that's a nice linear functional. And as we have seen, the norm of the functional is equals the L1 norm of the, of the L1 function, which is just the area under the graph taking in absolute terms. Now, we will see that by approximation of, of our elements by such nice linear functionals, or also by discrete ones, we can get a very good uh, idea of, of the structure of the dual space. We are going to identify, and that was one of the key steps so far, we are identifying all the translation invariant linear systems on C0, 
with the linear functionals. Actually, it's an isometric identification. The operator norm equals the norm of the functional. But now we have a clear multiplicative structure. By composing such systems, we get another system. And by transfer of structure, we can map uh, this over to the bounded measures. Now, there is an easy way to understand that uh, the Dirac deltas, which are just a point evaluation at a point x, are nice measures. They have norm one. And therefore, the composition of two such measures must be some other measure. But the operator actually is just, and that's why we have the flip in the definition in this identification, is just uh, the translation operator. And we know from, uh, it's obvious that translations are such that a composition of two translation operators is just the shift operator with the x plus y parameter, which in turn gives us that the convolution of two Dirac measures is just uh, the Dirac at the x plus y. Clearly, x plus y equals y plus x. And that's why the convolution of discrete measures, point measures, is commuting. But this also means that arbitrary bounded discrete measures commute. And we had a way to find out that by appropriate limits, not in the norm of the bounded measures, but in a slightly weaker way, we can guarantee that we have not only a multiplicative structure, but also a commutative structure. So uh, we, we were using some argument uh, of what do we call weak star continuity of, uh, of the convergence of the discretized measures d psi mu to the measures mu, and we will use this also today. The concept of weak star convergence is also important to understand why a Bibo system, which is, as we have seen now, a convolution operator by some bounded measure, why this can, why it's meaningful at all to, to define the impulse response. So in the engineering courses and books, very often you see, you just plug in a sequence of rectangular functions. Now my approach is valid for general locally compact abelian groups. And therefore I'm restricting my attention to continuous functions. So just think of instead of boxcar functions, uh, think of triangular functions. But these triangular functions, as they are concentrating more and more, they are not convergent. So they are not, as one often says, convergent to the Dirac function. And the Dirac function, therefore, is plus infinity, whereas it's zero at, at every point, uh, plus infinity at zero, whereas at any point else it's, um, it's vanishing or so. But we are just saying, no, this sequence has the effect that if you view them as measures, and this is the identification with the, in the way here as an integral, and if you apply it to a continuous function, then in the limit you get uh, to the measure. Here we would expect if you take a Dirac sequence of compressed triangular function, it goes to the Dirac measure. Now, I'm trying to explain today quite a few things about the classical approach to Fourier analysis, or I would almost say to the mathematical approach to Fourier analysis. Here the emphasis is on integrals. And uh, if you look at my advisor's book, Hans Reiter from 68, or the re revised version from 2000 with Jan Stegemann, you would say, well, first we have to establish L1 over a locally compact abelian group. Then we can start to do Fourier analysis. Um, but this is, from my present point of view, just uh, um, the way how you see, look at these things because you're focusing on how to determine the Fourier transform using an integral transform. So this approach, which puts measure theory first, gives you the impression, and I emphasize the word impression, it's not valid proof uh, fact, that the Fourier transform is an integral transform. And then of course you're studying what is the most general domain and you're finding that L1 is a very good substitute or an element uh, uh, in, the, in the toolbox and you're concentrating on it. Then you observe that the free transform is not mapping L1 into L1 
So the inverse Fourier transform is already delicate because you have to make extra restrictions and so on. We will see that, but this is part of the picture that we have. It's actually, I mean, we know that L1 is a closed subspace of the bounded measures, but it's also psychologically, it has been over centuries, or decades, uh, uh, closure in the sense that people were not looking outside of the measures. Now, uh, I would say uh, that the correct statement is on the subspace L1, the Fourier transform as we have defined it already can be viewed as an integral transform. And it's interesting because it puts the commutative algebra L1 with, you can say pointwise almost everywhere convolution and with bounded approximate units, the so-called Dirac sequences, which are substitutes for the unit element uh, with convolution, as I said, into a pointwise algebra. And then uh, it's easier to understand, for example, how to partially undo a translation invariant system. For example, if you think of image analysis, the filter would might be a blurring operator and you would like to deblur by taking an inverse of the two-dimensional Fourier transform uh, to sharpen those frequencies which are still present. So that's what, what our goal is actually. Now, I would like to give you an indication of, of the situation and we will discuss the scenario in much more detail very soon. I mean, in the next units. Uh, that the Dirac object is a kind of mystified object uh, sometimes, or it can be viewed as a serious distribution. So it's not a function, it's a distribution, it's a functional. But the well-established theory of tempered distribution starts from the space of rapidly decreasing function introduced by Laurent Schwartz. And that's a rather complicated but very versatile tool, which I tried to replace by a more harmless, uh, more harmless uh, uh, subject, uh, which is done by pure Banach space theory. I would like to mention that uh, that uh, we are going to demonstrate in this course that uh, there is a much easier way to, to get distributions, more generalized functions, so to go beyond L1, and that will be the banach gelfand triple. So you hear this word maybe for the first time of S0, L2, S0 prime. So this is our goal to, for, or my goal to, under, to teach you how to use this triple. And the analogy is to the number systems. So we have rational, real, and complex numbers. If you take Euler's law, it connects complex numbers with real numbers. If you think of infinitesimal expressions uh, describing uh, rational numbers or pi or irrational numbers, you have an idea of how the process will be, especially the process from rationals to real numbers. If you're in number theory, you may start from the rational numbers, you extend it and you take the rational numbers, extend it with square root of two. So yes, this is a field, you can do computations and they look completely different, let's say to the decimal expressions, or you may have continued fractions, but they're all real numbers. So th this is the kind of scenario that we like to view. We have functions, we have signals, and sometimes we are able to write integrals. Sometimes we are able to apply operators. Sometimes we have operators like the Fourier transform, which look like integral transforms, but you're realizing them only on the, on the um, smaller domain. So my usual formulation is take the rationals and multiplication. It's easy to invert multiplication instead of dividing by three over four, uh, I mean, to take the multiplicative inverse of three over four, you just multiply with four over three within the rationals. That will be the analog of the setting for nice function, the inverse Fourier transform is nice. How do you extend it? Let's say to get the Fourier Planchereau transform, you extend everything, but you never do the inverse as an integral transform. So this kind of idea should be, so we will see uh, that uh, it's reasonable to work in the pointwise sense we're in the setting of L1 intersected the Fourier algebra. So FL1 is the 
algebra, pointwise algebra of all the Fourier transforms. And, uh, but uh, in this setting, we cannot come back for, to what we have already seen, to the invert of the Fourier transform of a delta zero. Delta zero convolved with F is F. That's because delta zero is the shift by zero. So it's clear that you have identity. It's usually formulated as a mysterious sifting property of the Dirac delta, but it's just this harmless statement. Now, if you go to the Fourier domain, we expect that the Fourier, do, uh, delta, uh, Fourier of delta multiplied with the Fourier of any f should be the Fourier of f. And that can be only true for the constant one. We have a formal definition of the Fourier transform of a measure. So you take delta zero at chi of minus s, but any exponential function evaluated at zero will be one. So that's why this formula is just an uh, easy ex example. Now, we would expect that this, of course, has to mean that f to the minus one uh, is of constant one is the Dirac delta. But if you see how it's written, uh, we see uh, something, some formula um, that uh, we get. If you look at the extreme uh, part of, the, of this formula, we get uh, integral from e to the two pi i s t ds. So the smeared infinite sum of all the pure frequencies is the delta. Now, the way how I learned to read the, such integrals, but I find it rather confusing is to say, well, we're talking about some expression and look at the red term, which I read as take constant one, and it doesn't show up, of course, so you don't have to write it here. Then you do a formal thing, which is write an integral in front of the object, write a two pi i s t and integrate over s. And then you will get the inverse free transform. So I would say this, maybe I should change the order. This expression to the very left should be interpreted not as a real integral in the sense of Lebesgue or anything like that, but it should be read as inverse free transform and we will discuss how to do it properly without writing integrals. You have seen I have tried to avoid integrals very much. And then to say, well, we have a Fourier transform with an extended Fourier transform. And that's just the inverse Fourier transform of constant one. And that, of course, has to bring us back to delta. Mathematicians, of course, also wouldn't write delta of t. Um, so we would write delta zero without argument and take it as a, an extended inverse Fourier transform. but that's that's kind of uh, what we will do. So you see here, I was recalling we have for bounded measures um, this formula. We have seen you can extend the bounded measures to arbitrary bounded continuous functions, chi the pure frequency e to the two pi i s conjugate. So with the minus is a bounded sequence. So this is a well defined function, and we have already uh, seen that uh, or claimed that this is a bounded continuous function. We also will see that from the L1 setting, we will get to the L2 setting, uh, but uh, this is uh, only uh, something to be discussed later. Okay, so this is kind of the, the general perspective. Um, there are different ways to understand how to get from this, I call it the integral version of the Fourier transform to the general Fourier transform. So we are, I'm teaching you a, extended version of the Fourier transform. Actually, I started from an extended version and we do a speci specialization now down to the L1 setting. But it will be also connected to the uh, discrete Fourier transform, uh, which is possible for periodic and for non-periodic functions. So we have already seen that the discrete measures sitting on a lattice, that can be the integer lattice, that can be the alpha times the integer lattice, they are forming another closed subalgebra of discrete measures, and they have Fourier transforms, and these Fourier transforms are actually then periodic functions. So people are saying, oh, you know, we are not getting periodic functions, we're getting functions on the unit circle. So you identify periodic functions with functions on the circle, but this is another subject. And uh, also the FFT and the discrete Fourier transform are embedded into this, so they will extend the Fourier transform so that the discrete periodic functions 
So the sequ finite sequences, more or less, are mapped into these periodic and discrete objects, which are also finite sequence. And the FFT or DFT is just doing this in exact way. So how can you approximate, uh, let's say, an L1 function by discrete periodic functions or so? This is a point of discussion, which can be done within this banach gelfand triple setting. Okay, um, I'm coming now to, uh, I realized it's maybe good to um, tell you that we are uh, a technical uh, step and explain this because other things you can easier read in the, in the script or so. And it is about the locality of convolution. You can do this for ordinary functions. You can also, and we will use this also, but I, I'm explaining it first in our first and very natural setting. So we have the bounded measures. We have seen that the pieces are of the form mu psi i. And if you give me any finite set, this finite set is a measure which is more or less living where all these psi is living. We're saying it's a measure with compact support. We will define the support of a measure later on, just to give you an idea. Of course, the Dirac at X is supported on a one point consisting of the point X. And uh, so it's another way of describing that it has no action outside of this closed subset set consisting of that one single point. So it's true that what I'm using now as a terminology, compactly supported measures are exactly those which can be written in this form with the finite subset of the poo-poo. And in the same way, uh, that's a simple exercise. If you give me any function which has compact support in the usual sense, so it's living in a, in a cube or in a ball and zero outside, I will have a representation as a finite sum with the poo-poo, but also if you can write it as a finite sum, so our index set E, then it also will have compact support. So we are discussing now the behavior of uh, the convolution of some of two objects, both of which have compact support. Now, what we have to look at first, uh, that's the first step. We look at all those functions psi i involved in the first part and the psi j is in the second part. Now think of maybe a planar situation. You're thinking d equals two, then the psi are bump functions living on little circles in the plane. But you have only finitely many of them. So if you draw their supports, you will find that they're all included in some big ball, in some ball of radius r1. That means outside of that ball, everything is zero. Let me just, sorry, very short interruption. Okay, so uh, the same is true for the set E. Uh, and now we look at the Convolution, it's a finite sum, so you can do a sum over i over f and e of the pieces. So let's concentrate it on a fixed index i and j. So what is mu psi i convolved with f psi i? And it's a good exercise to say, well, it just means take the measure mu psi i, input the function, which is our f times psi j, flip it, shift it by y, then you get the output at the point y. Now, next step is what is mu psi i? It's mu applied to psi i times the rest. Of course, shifting, well, flipping a function, which is a product, is the product of the flipped. And then we shift each term separately. So we have ty of psi j flipped, and we have ty of f flipped. I want to pull out the f. And so we concentrate on the term in the square bracket. So there's a product of two bump functions. And of course, uh, uh, we are uh, we're interested only in those terms where this first factor is not zero, because if this is zero, then whatever f is here and whatever functional you use, you will get zero. So we have to concentrate on this situation. 
So the product function is non-zero, meaning is there is some point which is non-zero. Now, uh, <clears throat> we have uh, observed that uh, all the psi i's, so it's psi i of z, which are non-zero have to be inside a circle of radius r1. And this here, ty of psi j, means you are right, psi j uh, flipped, so it's not of z minus y, but y minus z. So this is what we get from resolving the flip and the shift. But that argument has to be in the circle of a ball of radius r2. But now we can argue that whatever uh, the uh, argument y is, and actually it should be, no, whatever the argument y is, one has to find some set uh, such that this is valid. So the set is dominated by R1. The difference is this, and we are, it's clear that Y equals set plus Y minus set. So only when the absolute value is less than R1 plus R2, we have a chance of getting a non-zero value. So the short verbal description is, uh, on the one hand, we will prove that the support of the convolution in any setting will be inside the complex sum of the two things. So that, that's kind of, if you're take, adding two terms, both of them are in the balls of radius R1 and R2, the sum will be in the, in the ball of radius R1 plus R2. Or uh, very generally speaking, if you to take two objects which have both compact support the resulting convolution also will have compact support. Now, we have observed already that mu with f for any C0 function will be a uniformly continuous function, so it will be continuous. But in our situation with compact support, you will get a function which has even compact support. So it's in CC. So we are having uh, this inclusion in L1. So L1, recall, is the closure, or we define it, as the closure of the bounded continuous functions viewed as measures inside of the bounded measures. Now, uh, we also have seen that um, the convolution is uh, submultiplicative. So the norm of a convolution product as a measure is controlled by the product of the norms in the measure algebra. But also if we have decent functions which are identified with measures, this measure norm is just the L1 norm. So we see that um, if you are giving me now a sequence, let's say the mu is already done, and the sequence Kn with which has just compact support or Fn with compact support, which converges in the L1 sense, then the mu star Fn will be a Cauchy sequence in L1. Each of the terms is in L1 because it's a Cauchy sequence and because this is a Banach space, it will be convergent. And of course, it will be convergent to a measure which is in the closure of the test function, which is L1. So we get exactly this property that uh, bounded measures convolved with L1 are in L1. Okay, so this is a rather important result. So the closed subspace of uh, Function of, of measures which are approximated by nice uh, measures uh, is uh, an ideal. And we had a different argument with the identification with the bound, with the continuous shifting elements. But I will use also this, and because this is what I need actually, is uh, that if you take the deep psi mu now, so you discretize the measures, and you, you ask what happens with this uh, when you take partitions of, of, of uh, parapupus, which are more and more fine, and you apply it to an L1 function, then uh, you're having a limit and this is convergent in the norm sets. So recall the deep psi mu uh, minus mu does not converge. For example, if you take these discrete measures and mu is coming from a nice function, so this cannot be norm convergent. Um, but if you apply it to some function f, then everything will be fine. So this is the argument. And now uh, I would say, uh, we have, I've written it several times now, so you will find such statements several times in the, in the, in the notes. 
and you can follow the details there. But uh, the idea is almost the standard idea. Well, we have to do something for every element in, uh, in the L1 case. So we have to do it first for those which we understand better. So let's assume that the measure is a compactly supported measure. Then and let's assume that the F is a compactly supported function. Then as we have seen right now, the resulting sum will be also a, a, a compactly supported function. We also have to take into account that maybe the measure itself is concentrated in a ball of radius R1, and then you discretize, it's like taking a histogram of the unit distribution, and you would take the histogram uh, with bad boundaries. So you would say, uh, I have a random variable with values in zero to one, but my bins are going from minus one to, uh, or, yeah, to plus two or so. And then maybe you're having a little bit of overlap. So one has to be a little bit careful and let's say, yes, all those deep psi mu measures are concentrated maybe in the ball of radius R1 plus one, but that doesn't change the argument. Now, all these measures, deep psi mu with K, compactly supported, will be jointly compactly supported. So the deep psi mu in their action at every point and uniformly over the whole support will converge. So we have this relationship in the subnorm, but if everything is living in a box, you can estimate the L1 norm by the subnorm, and you have this result for dense subspace of measures and for dense subspace of functions, I say functions, uh, elements in L1. So we have something like this, uh, the formula, I write a K here. And the general case that's now easy to formulate and uh, a little bit more boring to do the details would be to say, well, let's take a general measure and let's take a general function in L1. Now, the only thing I would like to mention is that if you take uh, a general measure, like a compactly supported close measure, close to a measure mu, and the discretization operator uh, doesn't make the difference bigger. So deep psi of mu will be, uh, let's say difference between deep psi of mu, a measure, and deep psi of mu, a compactly supported approximation, will be controlled by the norm of mu minus mu. And that can be made small, and that's kind of the trick of, of the story. So we will see uh, that uh, this is true. Now, maybe I give you an indication why this is relevant. Because if we look at the Fourier transform of the deep psi mu with f, uh, then we will see that uh, the deep psi mu, now mu is a measure with finite, finite discrete measure. So the free transform of a finite discrete measure, so the Dirac and linear combination is just a linear combination of pure frequencies. So the free transform deep psi mu hat is a decent, nice, uniformly continuous and bounded function. Whereas we want to see what the mu hat is, but if we multiply it on the free transform side with f hat with an arbitrary f, we get out of L1 convergence on the time side, we get uniform convergence on the frequency side. So roughly speaking, if we can build functions, free transforms, which are um, uh, non-zero in some big domain, we can get uniform convergence over compact sets. And that's good enough to say that the continuity of the free transform steep psi mu is going over to the continuity of the free transform of mu hat. So this will be a pass towards the uh, detailed proof of the fact that mu hat is a bounded and continuous function. Now, uh, the next part I would like to do is <clears throat> some exercise on, uh, on the uh, role of involutions because I need uh, a number of such small tricks. And that's more or less one of the few places where you will see quite a number of integrals. So let's start to recall that we have three different types of involutions already, and we will continue to use them. One is the ordinary conjugation. So F goes to F conjugate in the complex 
um, situation. So the conjugate function in C0, that's isometric, compatible with multiplication and harmless. For L1 functions, the flip operator is very important. The flipped version, and I use this check mark, is uh, just take uh, the function from the negative arguments. And you can combine the flip with the conjugation. And actually, you can write f star also as f bar uh, check mark. So the order, whether you flip first or you take the conjugate, is, is not important. Now, the Fourier transform, now you can take it as a Fourier transform for bounded measures, but I'm for a while I'm doing now ordinary L1 theory, and as we have seen, it's enough to do it for continuously, continuous compactly supported functions f um, using Riemann integrals. So the Fourier transform of the flipped version is the flipped version of the Fourier transform. So you change the order of applying the involution and the Fourier transform. Or the Fourier transform of the star function is just the conjugate. So the star operation is just doing the conjugation. We will demonstrate this last part uh, in, the, in the following sense that if we take a circulant matrix, so we take that exact situation in the, in the finite case, so the case of a finite cyclic group, then the, the star will be the involution corresponding to taking the transpose conjugate of a circulant matrix. Now, if you diagonalize a transpose conjugate, you're getting again a diagonal matrix, but the diagonal matrix has a conjugate entry. So that will be uh, uh, the finite discrete analog in terms of matrices, but I will do this later on. So just to show you that all these formulas are quite useful and we should not always explicitly write those integrals. It's enough to do it once and then use the formula so we have the following chain of equations. You're asking me, and you see, I'm trying to avoid the heads sometimes to make it more clear, and I take plenty of brackets. So you give me F in the flipped version and ask me to tell me what the free transform of this new function is. And I say, okay, let's look at a given value S. Now, this is, can be described as an integral take that function named f flipped at x, integrate against the conjugate of the pure frequency or against chi of minus s. Now the flipped function means you take f of minus x. And I prefer to already know how to continue because it will be more useful to write chi of s at minus x. This is obvious because we have the exponential function and to write S, uh, the argument as S with Z or minus S with minus Z is the same. We also substitute uh, now integration uh, over uh, of the RD and remind yourself that if you integrate, let's say over the real line from minus infinity to plus infinity, then you have a minus one in the dx. So dx is minus d set, but you integrate from minus uh, plus infinity to minus infinity and switching the back to the ordinary order, you have the, again, the integral. So if you do this multiple times, it's just changing the variable. Now, uh, we have, uh, in this way, we see that um, by substitution, we have an integral with set now. And you see it's, later on we will say it's the inverse Fourier transform, but uh, now at the moment, we just say it's an integral of F times the pure frequency. And you see I'm writing it now as a minus set, maybe you can do it shorter, but that means now formally is the function chi minus S, but the argument is minus set. So actually uh, the S should be a set here. So it's F hat of minus set, which is F hat flipped at the point set. So we have this property. In a similar way, uh, let's prove, uh, give you an indication of the star that the star goes to conjugation. Um, what is F star, the Fourier transform at S? Well, it's just insert F star into the formula, chi of minus S. 
what is f star? f star is f of minus x conjugate. You integrate against, now I, well, in this case, I found it more convenient to write it directly against e to the minus two pi and so on. But now I'm replacing again x by minus x, by introducing the new variable. So I'm uh, getting f of set, that's just replacing minus x by set. And inserting a set here is like a conjugation, which I undo by doing a conjugation bar separately. Now I've put the dot in between to see, well, we have a product of two conjugate expressions, which is the conjugate expression of the integral, which is the same as the conjugate of the integral. So we have internal you see it's f of set e to the minus two pi, which is f hat of s, and then you take a conjugate. And of course, uh, you have similar arguments to prove uh, when you start with the f with the third involution, which is the conjugation, and you find out that it will be the star. So we have again three involutions. The uh, flip operator, which is mapped into itself, I mean, it's commuting with itself, and the conjugation and the star operation. Uh, change the role. If you do one on the time side, let's say you get the other on the frequency side, or if you do one on the frequency side, you get the other on the time side. And of course, you could get this formula by combining the uh, back. Uh, you can say the conjugation is nothing else but the star combined with the flip or so. Now, we will make use of these facts uh, um, by, in order to prove the inversion theorem. And I think uh, this is a good point to take a break now, a little bit earlier than usual. Uh, so I would suggest that I'm restarting maybe at 9.05, so in about seven, eight minutes. So I will stop the recording here. Uh,